Good evening, everyone, and welcome back after an unexpected hiatus um, for the fourth of this year's Sailor Lectures. If you came here specifically for the fifth and only want the fifth, you'll have to wait till next week, as it turns out, but I hope you'll stay um, nonetheless. Um, the lectures then delivered by Josiah Ober, Konstantin Mitsotakis Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University. We offer our collective thanks to Josh for his flexibility and readiness to adjust to the necessities or the whims of the weather and PG&E. Uh, he even met his seminar, in fact, uh, even during the blackout in a characteristically Berkeley setting outdoors not in this case in protest against anything, uh, simply flexibility, readiness to adjust. Um, so we thank him very much and for his readiness to adjust the schedule, extend it one week um, and so on. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Griffith and I'm a member of the Classics Department. It's my privilege and my pleasure to deliver a proemium to this evening's lecture. It's long been the custom for the Sather Lectures, which is usually number six in all in a given year, to be thus introduced by a sequence of different colleagues. And we've heard already, not only from our chair in classics, Nellie Oliensis, but also from Leslie Kirk, professor of classics and comparative literature, from Emily Mackle, professor of history, while next week the introducer will be Professor Kinch Hoekstra from political science. This year's range of multiple home departments for the introducers reflects aptly the distinctive range and profile of Joshua himself who not only holds a joint appointment in the Department of Classics and Political Science at Stanford, with an additional, I think it's referred to as a courtesy appointment in philosophy as well, but actually began his teaching career in a history department and described himself regularly as an ancient historian. And as I recently learned, he almost became a field archeologist uh, when his permit for excavation in Greece was unexpectedly denied, along with a bunch of other permits for that particular year, in a state of panic, he reverted to a seminar paper he'd written a few years before, and lo and behold, in due course, emerged mass and elite. Um, such are the, the fortunes that guide our careers, if, if you have the capacity to adjust to those fortunes. He's internationally recognized by now, obviously, as a leader in each of these fields. Maybe not so much field archaeology, but yeah. He is international, yeah. And one can look around and see that his former students hold academic positions in all three types of departments as well. If ever one wanted to contemplate a human instantiation of the abstract form, capital F or ADOS, of interdisciplinarity, one need only gaze upon and listen to and read <laughs> Professor Ober. From Josh's writings on mass and elite, on Athenian policy making, on Thucydides, writings that focus especially on issues of ideology and rhetoric reflected within some canonical Greek texts, to his analyses of the Athenian economy, the institutions, mentalities, and practices of democracy, both ancient Greek and modern American, as well as the political and ethical ideas of Plato and Aristotle, as well as of modern theorists and critics of different kinds of political institutions, and in more recent years, especially, to his collaborative compilations and analyses of big data about the ancient world, and his testing out of different social scientific models that might help to explain those ancient phenomena and shed new interpretive light, both on their workings in their own terms and on their value as comparanda to our own contemporary world, Josh has demonstrated his flexibility, his astonishingly energetic, open-minded, collaborative and creative spirit of exploration, and his deep commitment to the pursuit of social justice and equality. And this sense of exploration tinged, dare I say it, with a sense of fun, i.e. of sheer enjoyment, of the challenge of trying to find out more about the ancient, especially Greek world, combined with passion, desire for the discovery and realization of collective human potential through social, economic, and political planning and well-designed institutional mechanisms infuses all of Josh's writing and teaching. And he does this as a professor of classics, just as he currently fills our say the chair in, say, in classical literature. In fact, he explained in his own words here, and I quote from a recent essay, introduction of his, when I moved to Princeton in 1990, he says, I saw more clearly than ever that the academic field of classical studies was a perfect environment for the work that interested me. Remember, he's moving here from a history department to a classics department. Because it, well, the field of classical studies was a perfect environment for the work that interested me, 
because it demands no sharp distinction between various aspects of history, military, economic, social, cultural, intellectual, or between history, literature, and philosophy. Those undeterred by their disapproval of the few who feel that ancient history must only be pursued for its own sake are free to bring in contemporary work on sociology, anthropology, psychology, political theory, and so on. Although this was not always so, the field is now remarkably liberal in its acceptance of methodological experimentation. And he continues, this liberalism rightly carries a requirement that innovators manifest a respect for evidence, reasonable clarity in expression, and honesty in laying out premises and framing arguments. Ancient history is currently a very good field for someone who plans to devote a life to the study of politics and political change. End quote. The titles of several of his recent articles and books, as well as the context and the venues in which he's spoken, confirm just what a good field this has indeed turned out to be, and what a positive and optimistic attitude Josh brings to the various fields of study that he enters and engages with. I won't go through a huge list, but just to note the range of venues in which he publishes, for example, a volume on the making and unmaking of democracy, lessons from history and world politics, or annual reviews in political science, American political science review, where he writes an essay on democracy's dignity, the good society, an essay, political animals revisited, democratic rhetoric, how should the state speak in the Brooklyn Law Review, and then one of the kind of side um, elements of his publication, like, well, one I particularly was fascinated to find and read his, his uh, co-authored introduction, Primates and Philosophy, How Morality Evolved, Franz de Waal, the um, he of the Bonobo apes, uh, on the origin of morality even outside the human species. But again, a very optimistic picture, um, an unthucydidean, unhobbesian picture of the state of nature. Um, it's, inspired, it's cheering to read works of this, of this nature. I want, as I say, it's time for me to pass to the important business of the evening. Um, and somewhere I have that in front of me. Um, yeah, here we are. Sorry. Josh has been, yeah, these are lectures on classical literature, the say the lecture in classical literature. And while the department has always interpreted this label quite freely, so as to include archaeology, philosophy, history, linguistics, and other subfields as well as literature, in the usual sense of that term, it has been quite striking, I think, to observe how Josh has chosen to present these lectures, full as they are of political, scientific, and sociological theory and models, to present them very much through a literary set of texts. He's been engaging quite closely throughout this set of lectures, whose overall title you'll recall is The Greeks and the Rational, The Discovery of Practical Reason. He's been engaging with major literary authors of classical Greece, Xenophon, Plato, Herodotus, even Polybius, I think Plutarch's on the agenda today, and I personally, as a literary classicist, with only a feeble grasp of political theory or moral philosophy, have especially enjoyed Josh's readings of Herodotus, as he alternates between treating Herodotus' as text as a set of exercises in rational choice theory, or the mechanics and political implications of different voting procedures, on the one hand, and on the other, subtly shaded human stories of irrational folly, what E.R. Dodds and his Sega lectures on the Greeks and the irrational would identify as the workings of Ate, while Josh also acknowledges the cunning manipulations of outcomes performed by some of the individual human characters in these stories and the artful ambiguity of the narrative itself as presented by its author, Herodotus. As Josh acknowledged two weeks ago, in the last lecture, Herodotus probably didn't do the math on the various voting options for his seven Persian conspirators. In that last lecture, number three, Josh left us then with a tantalizing smell in the air of potential democracy, or isonomia, as Herodotus would call it. As Herodotus' his forward-thinking aristocrats of Susa debated their best future constitution before settling for a Darius-headed monarchy. And today, Josh resumes with, we can anticipate, an account of the fulfillment of that potential, just over 10 years later in Athens. And the title of today's lecture is Twice the Need Wager, Democratic Rationality. Please join me in welcoming back Professor Josh Nova.
Thank you so much, Mark. Um, it really is humbling um, to be reintroduced um, uh, to the audience by people whose work I am so inspired by over the years, um, who have uh, uh, been both friends um, and models uh, to me. So thank you. Um, so uh, we'll begin with the same quote that I've begun each of the lectures with. Um, uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, um, uh, this is uh, Xenophon writing in the memorabilia, um, uh, Socrates' succinct statement of what I've been calling a folk theory of instrumental rationality. That is a theory that can't be ascribed to any individual. Um, here, I think Socrates not being particularly original, but rather um, citing um, uh, what is a general attitude among a lot of intellectuals of his time, uh, although putting it into a distinctive um, context. So I think that all persons choose out of what is available to them what they think is most advantageous to themselves, and they do this. So in the first lecture, we talked about um, uh, Glaucon's challenge. Glaucon takes that idea um, and reworks it into uh, the story of Gyges and the Ring, um, a story that I suggested um, had to do with how you reveal the deeper preferences um, of a perfectly rational agent um, when they're unconstrained um, by any other human agents um, and unrestrained uh, by the laws that um, other human agents make. Um, in the next lecture, we talked about um, the origins of social order. I called this Glaucon's Dilemma, spinning off of um, the standard uh, prisoner's dilemma game. Um, the idea is um, that it is extremely difficult to imagine how social order could ever arise among perfectly rational, self-interested agents. If everyone's completely rational, and that is, will always defect um, uh, when they have a chance, how do we ever get um, uh, a cooperative society? Plato's Protagoras, um, in the dialogue of that name, offers a way out of that bind, at least so I argued, um, uh, by suggesting a revised psychology, um, one that includes um, elements of justice and shame, and repeated interactions um, with learning over time. And the next problem uh, that comes up once we have a human society is who rules? Um, uh, what will be the organization of the political regime? Um, first answer for the Greeks um, was it is likely to be a king or a tyrant. Um, uh, uh, I started that lecture with um, what I called a kingship game uh, by Polybius, which models an answer um, to why a rational subject of a leader would choose to join a coalition um, that would support an aging leader, a weakened leader, um, against a potentially more um, vigorous uh, usurper, and why a rational leader would choose to rule as a benevolent constitutional king rather than a tyrannical despot, why not everyone would choose to be Gyges with a ring um, or diocese, um, the king of the Medes. So uh, the question we enter into today is, uh, how do we create a complex social order without kingship? So the Greeks knew that kingship was, or they believed they knew, that kingship was once the norm in Greece, and that it remained prevalent outside the world of the Greek city-states, as we talked about uh, in the previous lecture. Um, uh, but by the classical period, of course, the Greeks um, uh, were not ruled for the most part by kings, and they tended to associate um, one-man rule with tyranny um, uh, regarding the subjects of a king um, as, in some sense, slaves. Since slaves were considered to be, by the Greeks, unhappy, um, both because of the actual conditions of their life and because being a slave is inherently a bad thing, they tended to rank living as a slave at the bottom of their preference order. So we have a rational preference order. Um, uh, being dead is especially bad. Um, being a slave is just above that, um, if we were to ask the ghost of Achilles um, uh, in the Odyssey. So what are the political alternatives to kingship is the question that we enter into today. Um, how do we create a complex social order without a king? And one possible um, answer is um, at least raised in the second book of Plato's Republic, the so-called first polis, um, uh, a world with a sophisticated economy, uh, specialization of economic function, um, and yet apparently no rulers and no need for rulers. 
uh, Glaucon uh, challenges that first polis um, uh, well, by calling it a city fit for pigs. Um, uh, Socrates' acceptance of that objection leads to the need for guardians, um, uh, ultimately for philosopher kings, um, and so we don't get utopian libertarian anarchy. Um, the alternative um, to that might be um, uh, social order without kingship, citizen self-government. And certainly by the classical era, this was well known throughout the Greek world. Um, democracy was very much on the table, especially at Athens, but in other city-states as well. Um, and there were a variety of citizen-centered forms um, of political or organization. The question is, were they rational? Um, could rule by the many be considered to be, uh, in any formal sense, rational? Could a demos have ordered preferences and coherent beliefs, the two fundamental building blocks of formal rationality, according to that um, uh, folk theory? Well, Plato's Socrates says no. Um, uh, oh, however, various other theorists instead have said yes. Um, so Hannah Arendt, for example, um, speaks about acting and speaking together um, as being the purpose um, of the city-state. Um, and Oswin Murray, who cites Arendt, this is the first page of a famous um, uh, paper by Murray called Cities of Reason, um, uh, cites Arendt um, and comes to the conclusion that the Greek city was rational although it was fundamentally different from any other organization. So we have to ask ourselves, rational in what sense? Um, uh, and the core of this is going to be means or action connected in a coherent way to ends, that's goals or in um, Arendt's uh, terms, purposes. Uh, and I think we can basically divide the Greek thinking on rationality, or at least the kind of rationality I'm being concerned with here, which isn't particularly scientific rationality, for example, um, uh, but uh, uh, social rationality. Um, we can divide it into instrumental or a means rational agent who has orderly um, uh, preferences, um, given, not chosen preferences over outcomes, and coherent beliefs about the state of the world, and thereby chooses the option, the available option, per Socrates, that maximizes, that makes greatest of the agent's utility or the subjective value to the agent in light of the expected behavior of other agents. And that rational agent acts accordingly. So exemplary, uh, exemplary theorists here, sophists, later David Hume, various game theorists and economists. Um, and in contrast to this, or at least partial contrast, is the uh, ethically or ends rational agent who has the right that is ethically chosen or morally valuable preferences over outcomes and true beliefs about the state of the world, about how things really are, and thereby chooses the right that is ethically, morally best option among those available and once again, acts accordingly. And here the exemplary theorist is Plato um, uh, and the uh, uh, later um, Kant. Okay, so Plato's claim, I would suggest, is that Callipolis, the ideal state of the Republic, is both instrumentally means rational and ethically ends rational, and that Athens is neither. Okay, that the democratic state fails both to be an ethically um, uh, rational entity, um, but furthermore is not even um, instrumentally rational. My claim, by the end of the lecture, I hope I'll be able to substantiate this, is Athens, um, although not having a strong claim to being ethically rational in certainly a Platonic or Kantian sense is in fact um, uh, means rational, it is, it is an in instrumentally rational collective agent. Okay, so let's look at Plato's objection. 
So uh, Plato ranks the regimes in book eight of the politics um, in a descending sequence based on who rules, um, or at least we can rank it according to who rules. So we have Callipolis, the ideal state ruled by the wisdom lovers, the philosopher kings, Timocracy, after the collapse of Callipolis, um, ruled by honor lovers. Um, oligarchy, ruled by wealth lovers. Democracy, ruled by the many. And tyranny, ruled by a tyrant. That's rank ordered. Each one of them considered to be worse than the previous one. Okay. So uh, it's pretty obvious why Plato ranks three of these. Um, uh, Callipolis is the unqualified best. That's the whole purpose of the Republic, is to establish Callipolis and why it is um, uh, uh, the best possible uh, regime. Um, democracy is the second best. That's the rule of the silver soul, the original guardians, before we find out that there are true guardians, um, the philosophers. Um, and tyranny is the unqualified worst. That's been in Plato's crosshairs since the very beginning of the dialogue. So we don't have to worry about those, I don't think. At least it doesn't uh, seem to give us any particular trouble. Um, the puzzle is why oligarchy, the number three regime, um, is ranked above democracy, the number four regime. Um, why is this a puzzle? Uh, well, first, Plato has nothing good to say about oligarchy. At least I can't find a good word that he has to say about oligarchy um, uh, in the Republic. Um, and it seems to be ranked below democracy in some of his later works, the statesman especially, and certainly is ranked below um, uh, in Aristotle's politics. So the, uh, the later tradition in Socratic politics, broadly speaking, um, is uh, uh, not to uh, rank oligarchy above uh, democracy. And furthermore, Socrates, as well as Plato, his two brothers, um, Glaucon and Adimantus, um, all choose to live in Athens. If you are a sincere Socratic, you're supposed to walk your talk. That is, you're supposed to choose according to uh, what actually is the best, the best option that is available to you based on your current state of knowledge. Democracy um, is also described in the Republic as a good place for doing political philosophy, a kind of supermarket of regimes that you might choose among, whether that's ironic or not. Um, the point is, uh, is there seems to be some things about democracy that you might think rank them above oligarchy. Plato could have just as well have lived in an oligarchy, um, uh, uh, but he doesn't. Um, and surely Plato and company don't just uh, hang out in Athens because it happens to be where they were born. They're philosophers, after all. They have to choose for Socratic philosophical reasons. OK, so um, we've got a puzzle if you um, uh, follow me so far. Um, so how does he get this ranking? Well, certainly there's a descending um, uh, uh, sequence of ends. So uh, the end of Callipolis, Eudaimonia, is certainly better than victory, the end of democracy, um, which is certainly better than accumulation, the end of oligarchy. Things get a little murkier when we get down to the uh, last two, the end of uh, uh, democracy, freedom, um, and equality, but it seems to actually the ends end up being quite various. The means are freedom of equality, the ends are various, um, and uh, tyranny, just the end, turns out to be chaotic. Um, uh, so if we think about rationality of means and ends, then we can say certainly the first three are all instrumentally rational. This is sort of the main point here, is that oligarchy um, uh, is instrumentally rational in that it aims at a specific end, that is accumulation, even though that's an inferior end, um, uh, just as do the two above it aim at a particular end in a systematic way. Democracy is irrational, I'll suggest, in that there is a random menu of ends that is inconsistently pursued, tyranny irrational due to complete um, uh, incoherence. So therefore, we get rationality of ends and means, Callipolis, better than rationality of, end, of, of means, that is democracy and oligarchy, better than irrationality, democracy and tyranny. So, how, we ask, does democracy fail 
this test of instrumental rationality. And that becomes the question we can ask Plato. And I think we can answer it by looking at his guiding analogy in book two, that is the individual soul modeled by the state and vice versa, and then his descriptive method in book eight, um, the means and ends of the state um, are modeled by the behavior of the typical ruler of that kind of state, the oligarch or the Democrat oligarch, Democrat or tyrant. Okay, so let's look at the analogy um, first. Um, the uh, argument is, is that um, uh, the soul is modeled by the state. Um, uh, Socrates gets us to that analogy by saying that the search for justice, which what, what we're after in this dialogue, is going to be easier if justice is more readily apparent. We want to be able to see it more easily. Um, and so we get a couple of assumptions. First, that justice must exist both in a soul and a state. Um, and the second assumption is that states, being large, um, uh, uh, should have a greater quantity of justice in them than individuals being small. Um, so the example is little tiny letters uh, that are hard to read at a distance, um, uh, uh, like those little ones that are probably the young among you have no problem, but I certainly uh, couldn't read them uh, uh, at any distance at all. Um, and Socrates says, well, we're not, we don't have very sharp eyesight. Um, uh, uh, so it um, uh, would be um, uh, much easier to read um, if they existed somewhere larger and on a larger surface um, and if they were the, uh, just the same letters, um, tau, ota, grammata. Um, uh, so uh, uh, we then um, uh, get, based on this example, um, a couple of premises. One I'll just call the identity premise. That is, the soul and the state are as alike as is a single text or set of letters um, uh, written in um, uh, both small and large letters. Um, we'll have the same four virtues, the same three-part psychology, um, and so on. Uh, and the second assumption, the second premise, is visibility. That is, the state is more easily seen than an individual soul and therefore, because more easily seen is more easily analyzed. We'll see its various pieces more readily, um, uh, including justice and injustice, and we'll be able to understand the interactions between those various pieces um, uh, because they're more observable um, in the state. This is a striking thought, um, uh, uh, but let's move on. Um, the Kallipolis um, uh, rationality, both its instrumental, its means rationality, its ethical, its ends rationality, is manifest in its rational rulers, okay, in the philosopher kings. Um, uh, everyone else in Kallipolis, those who are ruled over, um, are rational just in so far as they obey philosopher kings. So we have the ruling principle um, brings rationality to the whole system, uh, and the philosopher kings exemplify or embody that ruling principle. And by analogy, to, to judge at least the instrumental rationality of these non-ideal states, um, these other four regimes, we should look at the rulers and at their relationship to those who are ruled over. So we can then jump to the descriptive method, to um, uh, book eight. Um, and here we see that the means and ends of a state-level regime are modeled by the behavior of a typical ruler. Um, so the Democrat, the oligarch, Democrat, or tyrant. Um, democratic irrationality, to cut to the chase, arises from the commitment of our model Democrat, or the, demo the ruler in a democratic state, um, uh, and therefore of the democratic politeia, the democratic regime as a whole, to freedom and equality, okay? Freedom and equality. Um, unlike the Timocrat for honor, the oligarch for um, uh, wealth, Freedom and inequality are not taken by Plato's Democrat as clearly defined goods in themselves, or at least they're not goods in themselves in the same way that accumulation and honor seem to be, nor do they specify, and this is a key point, any limited set of desired outcomes or ends. Um, instead, what freedom does is opens a doorway onto a wide range of goods 
and a comparably diverse range of actions that are aimed at securing that wide range of goods. So freedom is the doorway. It's not really the end in itself. It's the thing that opens up that way into a marvelous realm of different possible good things. Meanwhile, equality leads the Democrat to be indifferent in this very specific choice theoretic sense of indifference as equally strong preferences over two outcomes. The Democrat is indifferent to the possession of any one good over another. Each seems to him to be, at the time, um, uh, of equal value. So it's just a coin flip. Uh, what will I do? What will I be? What will I pursue? <laughs> you can flip a coin. Uh, they're all equally good. Um, as a result of the interaction of freedom with equality, each good catches the Democrat's attention momentarily. Each is avidly pursued, then easily dropped in favor of some other equally desirable alternative. Um, because all these things are equally desirable, you can just, the Democrat can just abandon the one and take off the other costlessly. I'm not having to leave anything behind of value because I'm taking up something of equal value. Uh, so uh, uh, there's no, um, as it were, cost to the internal accounting. And so we sum this up, handout number one. Um, the democratic citizen in the famous passage lives on, yielding day by day to the desire at hand. Sometimes he drinks heavily while listening to the flute, and at other times he drinks only water and is on a diet. And sometimes he goes in for physical training, and at other times he's idle and neglects everything. And sometimes he even occupies himself with what he takes to be philosophy. He often engages in politics, leaping up from his seat and saying and doing whatever comes into his mind. And if he happens to admire soldiers, he's carried off in that direction. If money makers to that one, there's neither order nor necessity in his life, and he calls it pleasant, free, and blessedly happy, and he follows it for as long as he lives. So that's irrationality a la Plato. Um, uh, and after Plato, there is a long history of thinkers, political theorists, who emphasize the irrationality of democracy. Joseph Schumpeter, famous book, Democracy, Capitalism, and Socialism from 1950, basically says that a mass of citizens is incapable of ruling themselves. It's incoherent to even think that they could because there's no collective will. Um, there's no such thing as a collective will. Um, uh, William Riker, um, who we've seen uh, met already, um, uh, argues that uh, because of the um, tendency of democratic voting uh, over three or more options to fall into cycles due to intransitive preferences, um, uh, that uh, it's impossible for a democracy to actually be um, uh, rational in formal terms. More recently, Brian Kaplan, Myth of the Rational Voter, you get the idea. Um, uh, Jason Brennan, Against Democracy, you get it even more clearly, make similar kinds of arguments. And yet, Democracy does deliver certain goods. Um, and that seems to be acknowledged by Plato. Um, Plato worried, indeed, the democratic Athens performed all too well, at least in grossly material terms. And this is very different from um, Brennan or Kaplan or these various um, uh, current critics of democratic rationality who say, uh, you know, democracy just doesn't do very well at delivering the goods. Plato thought it did deliver some goods. Um, uh, in Plato's Gorgias, Plato's uh, Socrates disparages Athens' leaders of the past, including famously Themistocles and Pericles, who they say made the city great. Those leaders failed to teach Sophrosune, Dikaiosune. Instead, they filled the polis with just the sort of trash that the Deimos happens to desire. What is that trash? Well, it turns out that it's, Plato says, Harbors, city walls, ship sheds, and tribute. That is, the means to the ends of security and welfare. Ask a Athenian, what's good about our society? It basically delivers the goods. We're secure and rich. Um, uh, we're good. Uh, Plato would say, you're not good. <laughs> but yeah, you do have those things. Um, OK, so there's the puzzle, then, of democracy's capacity. Um, 
Uh, I've argued at length, and I won't uh, rehearse the argument that democracy, uh, that, uh, that Athens in the democratic period was a highly um, uh, successful state, high performing, um, uh, surprisingly high levels of welfare and security by the standards of other pre-modern states, um, outperforming other Greek city-states by various measures, um, and specifically um, uh, demonstrating higher state capacity measured in various ways when democratic than when um, ruled by tyrants or oligarchs. So we get this puzzle. If democracy does deliver certain goods, taken as valuable ends by Democrats, if not by moral philosophers, then how does democracy deliver the means to those ends? How does a irrational system come up with um, delivering um, uh, the goods? How does democracy avoid irrationality in the sense of um, diverse intransitive preferences, chaotic false beliefs, incapacity to choose due to indifference, um, incapacity to act due to collective action problems, lack of a single will, factionalism, polarization, deadly conflict over competing interests, and so on. So let's go to history. That's, in order to answer this, we're going to have to at least go to a philosophical tradition about history, um, if not history um, as such. Uh, so look at uh, Solon, um, arbitrator and legislator for Athens in 594 BC, canonized by the Athenian tradition as a founder of democracy, one of the seven sages, lyric poet, um, uh, and uh, much written about. Um, mostly we'll be using, doing, uh, 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 working on with uh, uh, Plutarch and uh, the Aristotelian and Athenian Politeia, Constitution of Athens. So uh, very briefly, outline of what's happening in 494. According to the tradition, social crisis, poor being enslaved, polarization of elite versus mass, risk of social collapse due to civil conflict. Solon was accepted as an arbitrator by the two sides, um, uh, legislates debt relief, frees debt slaves, forbids uh, enslavement of Athenians. Um, uh, all of this seems to favor the masses. Um, refuses to distribute, um, the, redistribute land, favors the elite. Um, uh, creates various judicial procedure revisions favoring the masses. Links the right to office to wealth status favoring the elite. So on the final fourth page of your handout, the, you'll see this chart and some other bits. Um, uh, I won't go through it. It just basically meant to show what were the elite preferences, what were the mass preferences um, in very schematic terms. This is, this is really, really very schematic, but it's basically the idea um, uh, is there a, they have different preferences over these various things, over land and debt and labor and offices. Okay, so the background conditions in 494, uh, 594, both sides, mass and elite, have relatively low backstop conditions. The, the, the best alternative to negotiate agree, uh, agreement, that is what they have currently, while they're contesting with each other, um, and what they expect to keep if they end up fighting. So they're not going to drop below their backstop condition. That's the, that's the point. Each side, however, recognizes that there is a social surplus above its backstop. It could do better um, uh, if they could find the right way to um, share the surplus. Um, each is worse off with no plan of how to share. There is an external threat. The city-state of Megara is likely to take over the uh, valuable island of Salamis if the Athenians can't get their act together. There's a fear of internal um, uh, subversion by a tyrant. Um, and Solon has uh, credibility, reputation for patriotism, considered a man of the middle, and someone who rejects tyranny. OK, so under what conditions will a competing agent elite and mass in our case, choose arbitration over direct bargaining. Um, and here I'm just leaning on Brian Barry, important book called Theories of Justice. It will, these two sides will agree, if neither side believes that it can gain everything it wants from direct bargaining by threats and bluffs, if each side believes it will do as well from arbitration as it would from direct bargaining. So you're not going to give up anything with arbitration. 
Both sides believe the arbitrator is impartial in the thin sense of being unbiased, not perfectly just, just simply unbiased, um, and that the arbitrator will attend to bargaining strength but does not favor each side ex ante, or either side ex ante, and both sides fear failure um, to come to an agreement. So, okay, here's the situation, and I'll do this very fast. It's on your, uh, uh, the conclusion um, uh, to this little model is on the back page of the handout. Basically, what we have, I argue, is a non-zero-sum game. It's not the case that what one side loses, the other side gains, and there's only a fixed amount. That um, It's rather that if we can come to an agreement, we can both actually do better. So the idea here is that we, on the uh, vertical axis, we have the elite share of whatever surplus there is. On this uh, axis, we're going to have the mass share. Here's where we start out. The elite has this much in their, this is their backstop position, their best alternative to negotiated agreement. They've got this much. The mass doesn't have as much. The idea is they're doing rather less well off. Um, so whatever agreement there has got to be, it's got to do better than point P, right? We've got to be north and east of P um, if there's going to be uh, an uh, acceptable agreement. Um, uh, so how good could it get? That's what this um, uh, curve is meant to, as curve V is meant to indicate. Um, that's what's called the Pareto frontier. If everything goes just as well as it could, that's how much we could have. This is just completely schematic, right? Um, so it's just somewhere out here. Um, so we want to drive towards there. Um, and basically any point along that line that is between here, the backstop of the elite, um, uh, the backstop of the uh, mass um, uh, is possible. We could have, we could have, you know, a, a good arbitrator could find some way to div divide the surplus um, uh, on that line. How are you going to decide what point on that curve to choose? Right? Is it clear why you know it can't be down here because the the elite would be losing, or the mass would be losing? Okay. Um, uh, so how are you going to decide by relative bargaining strength? Um, uh, so basically, you just figure out, um, starting at point P, what is the slope intercept um, of a line um, that accurately um, uh, basically figures out the ratio between the bargaining strength of the elite and the bargaining strength of the mass. Bargaining strength basically being um, uh, determined by uh, uh, how ready you are to simply walk away from the table. Um, if you're more ready to walk away from the table, you say, to hell with it, um, I'll stick with what I've got, and you have greater bargaining strength. Okay? Um, uh, so uh, once you've figured that out, if there is such a thing, then you're at point Q, that's the answer. Um, uh, that is where you want to. Um, that's what the arbitrator ought to be trying to find. Um, uh, and so the point is, is that the, um, what Solon divides here, and this is what's on the back page, um, uh, is these various goods, and he divvies them up in different kinds of ways. He gives the mass some things and the elite other things. Not clear exactly how this goes. Uh, uh, and, uh, they each get some part of the uh, offices. Um, uh, the conclusion then is that Solon devised something like, and this is the payoff, um, a Nash equilibrium bargaining solution. Um, uh, basically, he intuited the solution that John Nash got the Nobel Prize for figuring out. Um, didn't do it with the math. There's a lot of math behind Nash's solution, but the idea is he has the basic um, uh, uh, intuitions. Uh, aiming at um, a bargaining solution based on background conditions, um, takes uh, bargaining strength into account, and aims at capturing full social value um, uh, somewhere on that, on that curve. The worry here is that multiple issues might make this in completely intractable. Um, uh, right, point P, if you think about it, um, where we start in our backstop is an aggregate of multiple basically backstop positions, a backstop position about um, uh, uh, land and debt and labor and offices. So it just seems like, how would you ever figure out where that is? That, um, uh, how could you ever um, uh, come up with an acceptable bargaining solution with so many parameters, with so many things um, uh, uh, going? Nicely, 
there is an answer to this. So this is just a basic uh, text in um, uh, game theory um, uh, by Dixit and Scaife. Um, they point out that often the enlargement of the set of issues actually makes it easier to arrive at a mutually satisfactory agreement because when two or more issues are on the bargaining table at the same time, the two parties are willing to trade off more of one against less of another at different rates than a, mutual ben a mutually beneficial deal exists. And this is just the point, is that there are some things that are more important to one side than the other. They'll fight if they don't get what, but they might be willing to deal on the other. Um, so trading off more of one against the other at different rates is exactly what Solon seems to be doing. So finally, about Solon, the question is about justice. Um, uh, a Nash solution to distribution problem, according to Barry, um, uh, can be thought of as a prescription for the arbitrator who wishes to produce an adjudication that will simulate the outcome of rational bargaining, right? So the arbitrator is trying to get to the position that a rational bargain could get to, but get there efficiently without um, a lot of fighting. So uh, having reckoned as well as possible the strength of each party's preferences over outcomes, effective arbitrators do not simply announce the award as a bargaining solution. They don't just say, I found point Q. Um, it's the best deal that you could get given the bargaining solution. Um, rather, they come up with some formula for relating the award to some principle, some comparison, or some preference. Uh, sorry, some precedent. So does Solon do this? Indeed, he does. He's got a formula, equity, basically fairness. He's got a principle, justice, in respect to distribution. And he distributes according to equity, according to desert, um, despite the avarice um, on both sides. Either side uh, uh, wants, wants more. Um, but he is going to do it equitably and justly. He has nice comparisons uh, or analogies, a wolf surrounded by dogs. Um, those of you who actually know your canids uh, will recognize that this is a wolf surrounded by wolves, but I couldn't find a picture of wolves surrounded by dogs, so it's the best I could do. Um, and he, uh, uh, the boundary marker uh, here, a uh, horos, um, uh, a divider. Um, the point here is that his comparisons acknowledge conflict, the wolf surrounded by the dogs, point to constraints. The horos is a constraining um, uh, marker. Um, and his outcome is not ideal justice. When Solon was afterwards asked, hand out two, if he had enacted the best laws for the Athenians, he replied, the best they would receive. This is a succinct statement, I think, of the outcome of a bargaining solution. There were better, more just laws but the refusal of each side to receive less than they believed they could gain by direct bargaining imposed a constraint on Solon's range of distributed options. And perhaps even more clearly in handout three, when Solon was already engaged in public affairs and compiling his laws, Anacarsis, the Scythian sage, accordingly, on learning what Solon was about, laughed at him for thinking he could check the injustice and rapacity of the citizens by written laws, which were just like spider webs. They would hold the weak and vulnerable who might be caught in their meshes, but would be torn to pieces by the rich and powerful. To this, Solon is said to have answered that men keep their agreements with each other when for neither party is their profit in breaking them, and he was adapting his laws to the citizens in such a manner as to make it clear to all that the practice of justice was preferable to the transgression of laws. And once again, this is not ideal justice. This is as good as you guys could get. Solon is not diocese, the ruler, the king of the Medes that we talked about in the third lecture. Um, he has some similarities. Um, uh, both have a reputation for a dedication to justice. Both arbitrate re, um, disputes, make laws for their community, have the possibility of becoming a sole ruler. The key difference is that Solon firmly, firmly rejected the option of tyranny in his own words, in his poetry, in his reported practice. He leaves Athens and comes back finally as a private citizen. 
And he's not a philosopher king. He's not a ruler. He cannot himself be the rational element in the state. He adapts his laws to the citizens in such a manner as to make it clear to all that the practice of justice was preferable to the transgression of their laws. But rational laws are not the same as rational rule. Solon's laws failed to prevent tyranny. That's what Anacharsis was predicting. Although Solon's laws survive the tyrannical interlude, it's clear that laws alone are not enough. So the puzzle of democratic capacity remains. I want to last, take the last few minutes talking about what happens with democracy. Um, uh, in 514 to 508 BC, Athens becomes a democracy. It uh, uh, starts with the assassination of a sub-tyrant. The Spartans then depose the top tyrant. And we have then a dispute between Isagoras um, and Cleisthenes. Isagoras does well at first, becoming archon. Cleisthenes then brings the demos into his coalition. Isagoras calls in the Spartans. Cleisthenes and 700 families who support him are expelled. The Spartans and Isagoras then seek to dissolve the boule, the council, but the rest of the Athenians besiege them on the Acropolis. Cleisthenes is recalled major constitutional reforms. Okay, if those of you who do Greek history, that's major constitutional reforms. Um, uh, <laughs> Obviously, you have to move right along. OK, so the point is, is that we can model what happens, this revolution of 508 and its aftermath, the Cleisthenic reforms, as a game played between three instrumentally rational, self-interested agents, each seeking to maximize its own advantage in recognition of the advantage seeking of the other agents. So we can have Cleisthenes plus his coalition, Isagoras plus the coalition and the Spartans, and the demos, the expectations of each agent conditioned on the expected behavior of the other agents and on the estimation of probabilities. So I'm not going to walk through the model. The point here is simply that we have uh, an outcome in which Cleisthenes doesn't get his top choice, which is, I'm guessing, to simply be the ruler. But he's got a uh, second best, um, uh, which is to survive uh, and be a key figure in uh, legislation. The demos is going to get its chop choice. Isagoras is not going to do well. Um, but the point is we can, the, each of these players had choices. And they're making choices based on the expected payoffs to certain behaviors. Okay, So you can work through the model yourself if you're so inclined. It's on the back page. Um, so we have each of these decision forks um, are ultimately, I think, quite explicable in terms of um, rational choices over um, preferred outcomes. And furthermore, um, there are probability involved. Um, there's going to be moments where there's going to be fights. Um, and we're not sure who's going to win the fight. You have to try to guess. You have to figure out what the probability of victory um, uh, might actually be. And these are also part of the game that has to be played. So in an analysis of the game, um, if we talk about it as Cleisthenes' wager, um, is that if he offers reforms, the demos will support him against Isagoras and the Spartans, um, and they will support him as a unitary rational agent that risks and at least potentially can win battles. And he wins his wager. Um, the demos, in fact, rationally accepts his offer, that is, join my coalition, take the risks of fighting um, uh, the Spartans, supports him through the whole revolutionary period, ultimately beats Isagoras and the Spartans. But the demos is also making a wager. Cleisthenes, that is, the wager that Cleisthenes has a workable reform plan that he'll carry through on the reforms after Isagoras and the Spartans have been at least provisionally beaten um, and will not establish tyranny or oligarchy. And the demos also wins its wager. Um, uh, Cleisthenes does have a clever plan, um, uh, and uh, he rationally follows through on his promise to implement his plan. The point is, is we don't have any saints in here. We don't have to assume that Cleisthenes is um, someone who is a um, uh, sort of an ideal democrat who plans to deliver um, uh, the 
regime of democracy to the Athenians. It's basically what we have is the outcome of uh, a game in which we have uh, various players each trying to achieve their ends. The end that we get with democracy um, uh, and the uh, outcome uh, is importantly predicated on the third party threat, that is the credible threat of Isagoras and the Spartans taking over ensures that the incentives of Cleisthenes and the Deimos remain closely aligned. So this story would go differently, so I argue, if you didn't have the Spartans in the story, um, if, if Isagoras could not um, uh, uh, generate a credible threat. So um, the hypothesis then is that Cleisthenes' reforms provide a framework for the development of a rational state, one capable of delivering security and welfare, that elites ultimately fail to capture the state because the citizen masses are capable of collective action, rational collective action. Continuous experimentation then drives innovation, and Athens adapts to change conditions, and all of this is facilitated by formal institutions um, and emergent cultural norms, and ultimately, therefore, the demos rules as a rational agent, Pache, Thucydides, uh, Pericles as the true ruler. Okay, briefly, rational preferences. Pseudo Xenophon, the so called old oligarch, points out that to his mind, democracy is morally reprehensible, but the point of his essay is how well Athens' many ordinary citizens manage affairs in their own self interest. Ordinary Athenians' high ranking preferences including, include not being enslaved which they would be, he says, explicitly under an oligarchy. This is handout four. Living well from redistribution and access to public goods and being catered to by imperial subjects. Once again, key factor um, is the persistent risk of oligarchy or enslavement. So the continued thir third party um, threat is important to thinking about the development of democracy. This is uh, a, a kind of argument made in Matt Simonton's uh, work on classical Greek oligarchy. So pre from preferences to beliefs, choices, and actions, if pseudo-Xenophon is right, then a diverse mass preferences are unified by recognition of the ongoing risk of enslavement, getting their worst payoff, um, or close to worst, um, not next to being dead. Uh, moreover, despite their lack of formal education and other failings, according to Pseudo Xenophon, the many had beliefs about the world that were coherent enough to enable their unified preferences over outcomes to lead to rational choices and action. And in some, then, many diverse individuals could, in fact, behave over time as a rational collective agent. How do they do that? Well, the short answer is democratic institutions. So the assembly and uh, the dicasteria, for example. Rational beliefs include what happens in the assembly when the Athenians listen to expert testimony, handout five. And I won't read this all through because uh, I don't want to take more of your time. But basically what Protagoras says in this is that the Athenians listen to experts on things on which there is recognized expertise, for example, building warships. Um, uh, Plato then, or Socrates, goes on and says, where there is not understood to be established expertise, like matters of justice, then they listen to just anyone. But for our purposes, the fact is, is that this is part of rationality, is attending to expertise where expertise is recognized. Furthermore, rational convergence on available outcomes. Um, so Mirko Canavero, in very recent work, um, has argued that in Athens and other democracies, the procedure of the assembly drives towards consensus and, in fact, is aimed at doing so. That's what they're trying for. Once a decree is proposed um, by the um, boule, the proedroi, the guys running the meeting, um, accept sequential amendments from the floor these amendments are judged by audience response, by the um, uh, hurrah, hurrah, sounds great, boo, boo, sounds awful. Basically, the idea is to try to um, get um, an item on the table, a proposal that can get as close as possible to unanimity. Um, Procedure is liable to all kinds of um, deformations, to um, voting cascades, confirmation bias, and so on. 
but it's relatively immune to cycles of manipulation. At least so goes uh, uh, Canavero's argument. And furthermore, we get rationality of innovation and of accountability. And once again, in very recent work, um, Federica Caragatti, um, uh, thinking about judicial procedure, and especially judicial procedure when it comes to constitutional measures, um, uh, how you challenge um, uh, the constitutionality of a proposal in the assembly, uh, what uh, Karagati argues is that the policy preferences of the median juror, the middle of the distribution juror, and the median assemblyman are closely enough aligned, well enough revealed by assembly procedure, such that a policy entrepreneur can propose a decree that gets passed by the assembly without excessive fear of prosecution by opponents. The proposer then expects to be charged and convicted if his policy is too far from the median juror's ideal point, so the most preferred position on the policy matter, but the proposer expects to be acquitted, once again, rational expectations, right, um, uh, if his new policy is closer to the median juror's ideal point than the status quo policy. So this requires that you have some sense of where the median uh, assemblyman, median juror is, but you have that because of what Canavero is talking about, so, uh, the uh, enthusiasm for one policy or another. There are finally rational incentives of elites to cooperate. Um, handout six, pseudo Xenophon, um, says that he pardons the demos for their democracy. One must forgive everyone for looking out for his own interests. But whoever is not of the demos and yet chooses to be a participant in a democratic polis rather than an oligarchic one has prepared himself for the resources for doing wrong. And he has realized that it is easier for an evil man to escape notice in a democratic polis than an oligarchic one. And here, sort of Xenophon misses his own point. His own point was all about people working in their own interests. The cost-benefit equation made it rational for self-interested Greek elites to cooperate with democracy. And this is the conclusion of a whole range of work that has come out you know, in the last 20 years. Um, Sarah Forsdyke, David Teagarten, um, uh, Mark Domingo Gygax, um, uh, and others. It's all basically aimed at why elites end up cooperating with um, uh, uh, democratic regimes. So in conclusion, Athens as a democratic state indeed had the potential to be a rational state in the rational choice theory sense of having collective rulers with adequately well-organized, that is, transitively ranked preferences, with coherent, if not internal, that is not internally contradictory, reasonably reality tracking beliefs, including beliefs about risk and other agents' preferences, with the ability to act on the basis of preferences and beliefs so as to gain the most desirable available options, institutions and norms that align incentives across social groups. So this is then the collective rulers, the demos, being fulfilling the requirements um, of formal rationality according to both ancient thought about what rationality is and according to contemporary thought um, that comes from rational choice theory. So the upshot then is a high capacity state. So how is that capacity used? Ah, as they used to say um, back when I was a kid um, uh, on the uh, Mickey Mouse show, the clock on the clubhouse wall says um, it's time to go. Um, uh, so we're out of time. Um, uh, but I do welcome you. We'll talk about how capacity is used um, uh, next time uh, when we think about Milos prospects. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>